tonight we have a super special guest. <laughs> Sorry, we have super special guest John Piermarini, former WWE writer. How are you, good sir? I'm doing good. How are you guys doing tonight? Doing good, doing good. So, um, pretty doing much good. first off, the question um, is: uh, so when you, how, when, and when, when did you uh, start writing for the uh, WWE? Uh, I started early 2009. Uh, I think I was hired in July, and then I quit uh, October 2010. So, um, did you grow up watching wrestling? Yeah, I was a big, uh, big Hulkamaniac. I remember it. Uh, I got involved right around uh, the Mega Powers exploding. And I honestly, I thought that was the uh, the greatest story ever told. I still think that that's the best wrestling story that that's ever been put on television. And um, from there, I was a huge Hulkamaniac. I I, I bought posters, and I remember. Uh, telling my parents I wanted to go to Venice Beach because I figured if I just went to Venice Beach, I'd run into Hulk Hogan. So they took me, and we walked around Venice Beach. I was looking at everyone trying to find him. I, I never found him, but uh, I got a cardboard cutout that I took a picture with. But, uh, yeah, I've probably for the last uh, – I'm 29 now, so last 23 years I've been a fan. So you, you said you worked from uh, 2009 to, the, to 2010. Um, so uh, why did you quit so uh, so soon? Uh, you know, it, it was a tough decision because that was pretty close to a dream job, but I just felt like, you know, it, it's all, everything is always great until you have it. And then once you get it, you know, then real life happens. And um, when I first got there, my mentality is always, you know, keep my mouth shut, figure things out, listen, learn. And I did. And I thought that uh, I was initially hired – uh, based on the premise that I had original ideas, I wanted to build new guys, and uh, I quickly found that that wasn't um, the mentality that they wanted to take. So, um, you know, over time I felt, all right, I gained some trust, I'll get in, I'll kind of show them that I can do what they want to do, and then I'll start kind of putting my stuff in. And then it got to the point probably um, – what really started to get frustrating was around uh, Money in the Bank when uh, we were going to put uh, give Orton the briefcase, who was then going to lose it the next night uh, with interference from Nexus. And, and I remember saying, all right, so are we moving from uh, after that to Orton to Nexus? Uh, and, and Brian Gewirtz, the head writer of Raw, said, no, we're just going to have him cost him the match. And I said, so you're you're taking um, something that could that could instantly build somebody, and you don't get that often uh, in the wrestling world, where someone can win a match or do something that instantly makes somebody. And uh, I said, we're dropping the ball when we have been building Miz, and Miz is ready, and this could this could create a, a new guy and a top heel if we needed it at the time. Not a top heel, but someone that could get to the top. And uh, I stood alone on an island on wanting Miz to win Money in the Bank and finally uh, convinced Vince that uh, it was a good idea and we went with it. And I, I just at that point started noticing your, anything that you want to do that's different than Brian, you're, you're alone on and nobody else speaks up, no one else pushes for their ideas. So that's when the road really started to get to me too. I mean, there's only so much that you could deal with being on the road for five days out of the week and not having a life when you're at home. And uh, I had just recently got married at the time. So that was, you know, you're missing your first anniversary. You're missing your wife's birthday. You're, you know, it's hard because you want to take her on the road, but it's hard to take her on the road because how are you going to take her on the road when I got to drive with, um, you know, my team from one place to another, when we, we, we leave hotels at, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning, what is she going to do all day? So it, it was just getting to the point where, you know, I sat down with my wife and we discussed it and I said, you know, it, I came here for a purpose and if I can't be here for that purpose, then I, I moved all the way from California to Stanford, Connecticut, which is a miserable place to be. And... Uh, <laughs> 
we just decided that we'd rather go back home. So I made that decision. And, you know, there, there are times that I wish I was still there, but then when you when I talk to people that are there, it's just kind of I'm just glad that I'm not. And I know that was a long-winded question, but uh, <laughs> that's why yeah. I left. Yeah. That's cool, man. Uh, now, I, I have a question about The Miz. Uh, you fought for him to get money in the bank, which he did end up winning and cashing in. Uh, what did you think of his title run? Because he did end up holding it for a pretty decent amount of time, but a lot of people didn't really, you know, even though he was the champion, a lot of people kind of feel like he was never really put over as, like, the guy. Do you kind of agree with that? Agree. Yeah, you know, I I, I liked the length of his, um, of his reign, but I, I don't necessarily um, – I don't necessarily think they did really much with it. And, and and I think they really needed to make Miz's rank strong for the simple fact that Miz was already perceived as a probably a non-WWE champion caliber champion. Um, and I think he had that stigma, and I think that they needed to really get with Miz as, a, as opposed to really sort of showing that this is a weak champion because people already believed he was weak, and he didn't add much to the credibility of the title when he's going out there week after week and losing to Jerry the King Lawler. Um, I understand the concept was to try to get someone that could get him over, but they failed miserably at that because that whole thing got Jerry Lawler over. Um, but, you know, I can't, I can't really necessarily remember exactly what I would have done different, but I remember at the time, you know, having some different ideas. I think they dropped the ball on um, not having him work a pay-per-view program with uh, with Morrison. Um, but, you know, yeah, man, that was lame. The, the raw shot. match, like, it was it was a good match, but I, I remember a lot of people were really yeah. disappointed by the fact that it was kind of uh, downgraded, I guess you could say. Yeah, that would have been, that would have been a great pay-per-view match. Um, he'll get another shot with the title. Uh, I think Miz is someone that Vince believes in, and I think that, He's willing to to build his his company around, so uh, you know. Hopefully, next time around, he gets he gets a better reign. Yeah. So, uh, moving from the end of your uh, tenure with WWE to the beginning, what was the first thing that you wrote and you saw on TV, and and like how did that feel when you when you saw it? Wow, uh, the first thing that I wrote that went on TV, I I honestly don't even remember. I, uh-huh. To me. It wasn't necessarily – it wasn't that important to to get something on TV. Um, when it happened, you know, it was great. You know, it's, it's, it's – you're watching – you're watching your creation get told in front of millions of people, which is fun. But I, I don't remember having that feeling of this is my first thing and I'm always going to remember this. Um, the thing that I remember the most, um, quite honestly, is, is – uh, creating and working with Vince on the Alberto Del Rio character um, and just kind of seeing how literally taking nothing and and molding a guy who is is really nothing like that character and, and watching him evolve and, and watching that character sort of build and become something out of out of literally nothing. So I don't even remember the first thing I wrote. I remember the first guy that I worked with was was Alex Riley and sort of developing a character with him and, and helping him uh, uh, write his promos for dark matches. And I remember at that point, um, I, I, I remember seeing something in this guy, and I remember saying, we could bring this guy up. He's ready. And I, I had him actually, um, I gave him what ended up being Swagger's character when he was champion, sort of the accolades, you know, I used to do this when I was 16, I did this, and and he was working those promos as dark matches, and I remember kind of being really proud of the work that we were doing, uh, because I felt like if I could take this guy as my first project, develop a character for him, and, and get him on TV, then, okay, they could, they could see that I can contribute, and uh, I remember Cena at one point was high on, on uh, Riley, but just thought that he just needed more time, and uh, so they sent him back down to FCW. But that's another guy that I'm proud of and working with him and helping him develop uh, a character. And I worked with him a lot, too, even when we, uh, when we brought him up and moved him over to Raw with Miz. Because uh, at that point, I was, I was pretty involved with Miz's character and his promos and stories and stuff like that. But, um, 
Uh, yeah, I wish I could even remember the first thing yeah. I got on TV. I, I would probably uh, – it was probably producing a backstage pre-tape, to be honest, and, and I don't even remember what it is. So, um, with that said, who is, uh, who, like, who is your favorite wrestler to write for while you were there? Ooh, you know, uh, it's tough because I would have to say it was probably either Swagger or Miz, only because it was fun to write with those guys. If I had to choose one, honestly – I would probably say swagger um, because when I write for somebody, um, I, I, I like the creative process in, in coming up with, uh, you know, what ends up being on TV and, and taking a subject and trying to make it as entertaining as possible. And Miz was good at this too, don't get me wrong, but I would sit down with swagger and I'd have my promo for him and he would sit down and he'd already know what he wanted to say and we combined the two and it was fun and it was a creative process. And a lot of the guys there are great at contributing, although um, not a lot of them have a lot of great ideas. And, 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 you know, I was lucky enough to be able to, to have somebody that did improve on, on what I would write in Swagger, in Miz. Riley was another guy. Drew McIntyre was really good at that. But choosing one, probably Swagger. I always, every time there was a Swagger promo, I had to have it. And and uh, just because I knew whatever we did was going to be good. And, you know, I don't know. I honestly actually don't know what, and maybe you guys can help me this, uh, what the consensus was on Swagger's title reign and his character at the time, because I didn't really have time to read the Internet and read reviews. But maybe you guys can help me out and kind of tell me what people thought about that. Um, it was, I think it just really kind of called people off guard because he won it so quickly after Money in the Bank. So it was kind of a, a little bit of shock value. Um, right. I don't really remember what the, I mean, kind of like now when people look back at it, I think it's kind of like laughed at because Jack Swagger, since winning the title, right. has kind of gone like further and further down, which is really unfortunate. Yep. But uh, I remember yep. his stuff he was doing with like the Eagle and his dad, like that was really over. People really liked that. Yeah. Um, I, although I, I yeah. don't remember if that was with his title. Yeah, I guess when his dad came in, it was when he was the champion. Yeah, people like people like this stuff with the, his dad and stuff. I do recall that. Good. Okay. Yeah. You, you know, it's it's funny. Um, the the reason why Swagger got the title so quick. Initially, we were going to put the WWE title on him, um, but uh, I can't remember. Well, I, it doesn't matter where we were. It was the week after WrestleMania, or is the week. Yes, the week after WrestleMania. It was the first SmackDown after WrestleMania that he won it, right? Yeah. Um, SmackDown, the writing team had, had their SmackDown set and um, pitched it. Or, I'm sorry, before they pitched it. Uh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm trying to think here. So they pitched it in the production meeting to the producers and creative and Vince and Kevin Dunn. So <laughs> Vince lets Michael Hayes read the entire show. He gets to the end of it, and Vince goes, and we're not doing any of that. And he goes, here's what we're going to do. And at the time, SmackDown was really struggling as far as kind of being creative and, and having entertaining shows and, and, and popping a rating. And uh, Vince said, okay, so we're not doing any of that. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to start the show, Edge. Well, essentially what happened, I don't have to repeat it. And, I mean, it caught everybody off guard. I was excited about it because that was something, again, that I was working towards in, in wanting to build Swagger to, to, to main event. And I knew that – at the time, I was given Swagger as a character, so I knew that at that point I would be writing main event stories and promos and stuff, so I was excited about that. But that was very, very shocking to hear that he wanted to do that so quickly. And, you know, I don't think it got over that well in the back with certain people, uh, and certain people didn't want him to hold the title because of how he was positioned on Raw right before it. I, and I don't want to say names, but I remember at one point someone said, uh, just because you put a world title on a mid-carder doesn't make him a champion. It, it makes the title mid-card. Mm. And uh, I, I, you know what? I agree with that, but I disagree that people were trying to hurt building somebody new. And, uh, you know, luckily we went with it, and I think Sw – personally, I think Swagger knocked it out of the park. I don't think that when you look back at it now, knowing what Swagger has become, 
yeah, you could laugh at it and go, really? Swagger was a world champion? But at the time, he was really gaining momentum, and people were starting to forget about what he was doing on Raw. And, uh, you know, I, I think it was fun. All right. Now, I know you didn't want to stay too long, but do you mind if we ask you one more question before we let you out of here? Absolutely. Sure. All right. So this is just for uh, for us outsiders, us fans who don't know much about the WWE uh, inner workings. Uh, no, you know, you don't have to reel too much, but what, what is like a typical day or like a typical like Monday Night Raw like for a writer? But day in the life. Um. Okay. So I'll just kind of tell you, you know, a typical day for me would be uh, show up to the arena at. Um, Gosh, probably 11 o'clock, uh, eat something in catering, and the catering was always horrible. Um, and then you got a production meeting at about 12, which is Vince, Kevin Dunn, Triple H, uh, the writing team, and the producers. And uh, you read Raw. Brian would read Raw. And um, at the end of that, the producers would talk about how uh, they want to go over the matches, how, you know, certain spots or the story that they're going to tell. And then uh, the the producers are dismissed, and then it's the writing team in there with Vince, and we go over promos, and we go over uh, other aspects of the show, uh, not match-related. Sometimes it is match-related. Sometimes we make changes, and then we have to tell the producers. Uh, That probably takes you to about 4 o'clock. At that point, uh, everyone has their assignment for the day. So, for example, let's say I have a Miz promo. So um, I'll probably go get something to eat. I'll find Miz. I'll tell him, hey, in a half hour, let's meet. Let's go over your promo. I may or may not already have something written for it. Um, I sit with Miz. We go over the promo. Uh, I was different than a lot of the writers in the sense that I would sit with talent as long as they wanted to to sit there and go over the promo and I check in with them. Now, I know if they have a match, that's different, but um, I'd work with them up until they had to go out. And so, you know, if, if Miz has a, 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 his promo in an hour into the show, then okay, great. Uh, an hour in, we're, um, I go in Gorilla. I produce the, um, the segment on headset sitting next to Vince, you know, talking to Kevin Dunn, telling him when to play the music what the last line is, or if someone, if there's going to be physicality, you have a producer on it, but I need to get to the physicality part so the producer can take over, Um, you know, just so Kevin knows where to put cameras, stuff like that. So when that's done, if that's all I have, I'm done. I'm going in the the writer's room. I'm hanging out. I'm probably watching a baseball game, a football game, uh, looking on the Internet, just BSing, uh, hanging out with, with, you know, talent if, if they're just hanging out backstage. Uh, sometimes I would be, um, uh, going over a story with somebody. If, if we were putting a story together that we were going to pitch, I, I do my segment, meet with that talent, sit down with them, go over stuff. A lot of times talent would want to pitch stuff to me. So when I was done with the segment, I'd sit with them. After that show's over, you wait for the dark match to end. Um, you get in a car and you drive to wherever it is that we're going to go. You get three hours of sleep. You wake up the next day and you do it again. So, like, on Raw, you're you're literally, like, putting together, like, something, like, literally up until right before it happens, in a way. Um, it depends. Like, for example, you know, let's just say I have a promo. I'm sorry, I left one thing out of the, of the uh, which I'll, I'll include here. Let's say I have a Miz promo, and, it's, and it's, he's going to he's gonna cut his promo at uh, 8.45, um, I'm sorry, 9.45 after Raw starts, 45 minutes into the show. So what I'll do is the, the as soon as we get done writing the promo, and we're both happy with it, um, I go knock on Vince's door, and I cut the promo to Vince, and, and towards the end of my time there to, to Vince and Hunter. We got – I don't know if this still applies to Miz, but eventually I got Miz to the point where Vince didn't even want to hear Miz's promos where it was just, if you guys got something, I trust it, just go with it. It's up to Miz now. Uh, if he likes it and he puts his word on it, then then I trust it. So, um, But for the sake of telling the story, I go in there. Let's say Vince loves it. Then great. I've got two, two hours, sometimes three hours before Miz has to go out there and cut the promo. Now, he may not want to go over it. He may want to, so I, I'm at his disposal. If he wants me the rest of the night, fine. Um, and uh, But let's say Vince hates it. 
you got to rewrite the whole thing. Okay, well, I got to sit with Miz. I got to rewrite it. Now, let's say when when uh, Superstar starts, Vince is getting ready to head to Gorilla. So if he goes to Gorilla and he's producing the show, now now you're getting nervous because now you've got to find time for, for you to kind of get his attention, give him the promo. If he doesn't like it, now you're up against the wall because, all right, how long do I have until, you know, I, got, I need Miz to memorize this. I need him to be able to rehearse it. Um, and so there's times that literally the, you have – a half hour before your promo is on and you still don't have approval from Vince. But if that usually happens, nine times out of ten, I'll say, look, this is the last one that we're going to be able to do. If Vince doesn't like it, we're kind of screwed. So just memorize this. Let's go over this. I'm going to try to get with Vince, and hopefully he goes for it. And usually when you're up against the, the clock at that point, he, he'll, he'll make a few adjustments to it, but he'll let you roll with it. But um, – for the most part, you got enough time to kind of do your thing backstage a little bit. All right. Well, we're we're gonna let you go because I know you don't want to stay on too long. Uh, anything you want to plug? Uh, nothing to plug. But uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at John as himself, J O H N as himself. And uh, other than that, not at all, man. Just uh, thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, man. Anytime. Thanks for coming. Take care, guys. All right, have a good one. See you, John.